Right. By the way, I've, I've, been do, I've, I've been doing these Zoom shows like for the, for the entirety of this, this quarantine bullshit. This is a very fun format. Like the concept, the, you know, the, the topics and one topic to the other. I, I, I'm enjoying this. This is cool. That, that, you know, thanks for having me. Well, it's about to, we, we really appreciate that, but it's about to take a dive now, Lou, because we're going to talk all about you. <laughs> so no, one, no one wants to hear about me. <laughs> Lou, I don't, I don't know if you can hear me because there's thunder and lightning behind me. All I can remember when you were, you were the, the main man at HBO and you did that jump and it was all the word like this guy knows both sides of the ropes now. There was a TV. He's seen it. He's seen. He's seen the light and stepped over to the other side. What's the transition? Be, what was the transition like from stepping out of TV well, into well, this dirty rotten sport? You know, the, the interesting part, I'm going, to be like, I'm going to be totally honest. Any person, if you know me, you know I don't really bullshit. Like, I, I like to tell, like, my reality. Um, the reason I left HBO at the time was because I wanted to run HBO Sports after Seth Abraham, who was my boss. And I had spent 10 years sort of waiting, a long time sort of waiting. And then I felt that the company was less than honest with me. And I walked into a meeting, and I learned something in a meeting that it was really troubling to me. and and then I got into a, a, a sort of a, a back and forth with the guy that was running HBO at the time, my boss's boss. And anyway, like, I thought he was disrespectful to me. At the time, I was young, really young. And I was, like, feeling my oats. I thought that I was, like, not replaceable. When, when meanwhile, in any company, everyone is replace, replaceable. And I told the big boss to go fuck himself. And, <laughs> and so it wasn't, like... And now I, I I didn't get fired. I didn't get fired. They 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 would have let me stay. But the, but the reality was I wasn't content any longer. I, I wasn't content to just do boxing and be in a secondary <laughs> position. And and if I was going to do boxing in a secondary position, I was okay with the idea of leaving. So I, I really sort of like brought upon my own the, the, that transition, not necessarily by complete choice. So. It, and by the way, I mean, I, I think now, if I was, if I knew then what I know now, I would not have told the guy to go fuck himself. I would have handled myself a little bit more politically astute. But, but you know what? When I look at it, I wouldn't have produced films. I wouldn't have been in a Rocky movie. I wouldn't run. I wouldn't have bought two minor league baseball teams with my friends. There were a lot of like things that happened in my life that wouldn't have happened if I would have stayed at HBO. So even though it wasn't like a totally, like you know, intentional exit, um, I, I don't regret it. I don't really have any regrets. Can I just ask you, just while we're on HBO, how sad were you when it all wrapped up there? When you consider the history and everything that was HBO, how sad were you when it wound down and finished? Did you feel any uh, sad? Literally, like for oh, oh, I mean, Richard, you couldn't even imagine. Like it, to me. Honestly, like I was, I went into like literally a depression for a while. It was like a family member dying because HBO boxing was my life for 11 years, yeah. you know? And, 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 and at the point I left HBO in 2000, HBO by far was the number one, uh, you know, broadcaster, telecaster of boxing in the world. So to watch it in, in one generation go from being on top to no longer existing like I, I sort of always felt that HBO boxing was a little bit of my legacy. And then I, it was like watching your legacy disappear. So I, honestly, it was deeply depressing to me. Yeah. It's a bit like, I suppose we all say it about when you match a fighter and then you take a bad face. It's like building a model bow into it, a, a matchstick bow, and you walk off and leave it, and then a kid runs in, picks it up, and throws it at the wall. <laughs> yeah. Lou, you, you obviously you went from working at HBO to promoting. What were the main differences, you know, from doing that? Was it, I know you, I'm sure you was much more of a, let's say a one-man man, but a smaller team, obviously promoting. What was the main differences that you found from switching? Well, you know, it, it, Anthony, it's, it's a tremendous difference between being a buyer and a seller. When you're a buyer, right, everyone's kissing your ass. Everyone loves you. Everybody wants to, you know, have your ear. Everyone wants to talk to you. Yeah. When you're the seller, you're just the one, you're one of a bunch of other blokes trying to get out there and make a buck. So it's a completely, like, just innately, the whole power thing is different. 
And and also I had I had a lot of theories as a television executive and as a uh, as a boxing TV person that a lot like I think in a way there are very few really networks and streaming services that are really controlled by boxing guys that know the sport. Like my belief as a TV executive was a name fighter fighting an outmatched opponent is terrible television. I would rather see a B-level fighter evenly matched with a B-level fighter in World War III than watch Devin Haney fight some kid who was pulled off a bench in Venezuela. Yes. You know what yes. I mean? So, so I came to promoting with that same thought, which is let me make great shows. But people were like, what belt is it for? What title is it for? And, 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 you know, and I'm not the best politician with the ratings organizations. I don't, I don't buy conventions for them. I don't, buy, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, you know, the politics of boxing are, 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 even though I've been in the sport for 30 years at a high level, the politics of boxing are still rather like unsettling to me, you know? So I'm still not, 20 years later, Having been elected to the Hall of Fame, I'm still not fully, co you know, comfortable with being a promoter. Honestly, I, I would love to be a TV executive again and be able to go out there and do it the right way. Right now, these three avenues of PBC in one direction and and the Zone, God willing, in another direction and ESPN in another direction, we're for the last few years we were spending more money in boxing in the United States than we've spent in the last generation and getting shittier fights and not getting the biggest and best fighting the biggest and best. And, and the, you know, a television entity, a television network or a streaming service should be making the best fights they can across the board, not exclusive to one company or one entity because the exclusivity is destroying the sport. And I'm like, you know, I'm probably in the United States the most significant promoter that doesn't have his own platform. But that allows me to speak the truth. None of this shit is helping the sport. It's not. I mean, you have three different avenues. And, and I mean, Bud Crawford, everyone screams pound for pound. He's never fucking fought anybody. And I, I mean, I'm not blaming him, but yeah. he still hasn't fought anybody. And, 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 you know, like right now when ESPN is in plus is in competition with the zone as streaming services, why would you expect that fighters would readily cross the street? They're not going to, they're exclusive contracts and they're not going to readily cross the street. And, 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 and the whole setup of boxing, particularly as it operates in the United States, but frankly, right now, as it operates all over the world, it's the rich get richer. And the best fights don't happen. And to some extent, who gets hurt the most? The fans. And over in the UK, you have a lot of them. Over here, we have fewer. Yeah. Wow. Well, you've answered one question about the rankings. What about, but how, do you, how soon do you think things will get back to normal over there in the uh, uh, States? It's a very good question. I, I don't think it's going to get normal until there is a vaccine readily available and, and, uh, and this whole Corona thing is completely in the rear view mirror. I don't think there's any normalcy for the rest of 2020. Um, if I had to guess, I'm hoping for next summer. Well, next spring. Yeah. I think you could I mean, be at least over here. I, 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 I don't see, I don't see, I don't see myself doing a show in the New York area in 2020. Okay. Uh, next one is a bit of a delicate one. Uh, give me your top five heavyweights now, today's. Top five heavyweights. Number one, Fury. Um, no, number two, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, this is going to sound crazy, but I probably would lean a little bit to Joshua just on the base. If you're only looking at Deontay's last performance, you might say Joshua number two, but I'm still not convinced that Joshua would beat Deontay. So I'm going to go number two and 2A. Two as Joshua and Deontay until they fight one another. Wow. And wow. number th and and number three, probably at the moment, probably Dillian White. You put him in, and, 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 and maybe yeah. no, and maybe and maybe number uh, I I I don't know Ruiz is in that area too. Um, 
I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of when you get below the top three. I think there are a lot of legitimate contenders out there, and I think mm-hmm. the numbers of contenders are growing. You know, I think that there are young heavyweights undefeated that haven't had the chance to prove themselves against name opposition, but that you're going to hear a lot more of. I think you're going to hear more of of uh, of Hergovic. I think you're going to hear a lot more of Junior Fa and Hemi Ahio from New Zealand. I think you're going to hear more of the kid I have from Uzbekistan, Jalalov, the big kid, the big Uzbek, um, who's who's a, who was a favorite to win an Olympic gold. Um, I, I like uh, was it Dubois is, is a good fighter. I think that I want to see I want to see where Joyce goes from here. I mean, there, 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 there's a lot of guys on the on the on the horizon that are that are coming up. But honestly, those guys have really gotten hit hard by this pandemic because right now they're not cheap. It's not easy to make a great heavyweight fight, and they're not the heavyweight champions, so they're not getting all the attention. So it's you know you know, but we need. But I think we need to develop that up and coming crop of heavyweights. I think there are more quality heavyweights on the horizon right now than there have been for a long time. Um, yeah. No, I was going to. Do you know what I wanted to ask you, Lou? Just stepping away from the heavyweights for one minute. I, uh, you know, I see a lot how Tevin Farmer's life's changed around, and that's one of your many success stories. Is there, I mean, it might be Tevin, but do you know, sort of Regis, Tevin, um, Richard Comnett. Is, is there a favourite story that you've got, you know, a fighter that sort of turned the life around, sort of made, made a success through boxing, who you've helped along the way? I mean, you know, there's a lot, I hope that there's a lot of them, Anthony, and, and I'll be honest, like, at this stage of my life, um, if I don't, like, relate to a kid or I don't like somebody, a man or a woman I'm working with, like, I don't really sign them. And, and, and it's not necessarily only the best talent that I'm signing. It's people that do have good stories and, yeah. and are hardworking kind of people. I mean, I'll give you a little illustration because he's fighting on ESPN this Wednesday night against Jose Pedraza. But I have this kid, Mikel LePierre. He fought Maurice Hooker already for the title, went to this, uh, yes. him a decent fight, but he lost. But this is a guy who I've been promoting for a long time. He was a major amateur in New, New York area, Golden Glove champion. Yeah. But he's, wor- he's worked... 10 years, he has 10 years of, of seniority. He's only in his, like, 31, 32. He's worked already 10 years at a major New York hospital and spent the entire pandemic wearing, wearing the, the, you know, the protective garments wow. and, and helping them admit, admit patients in the respiratory ward. And while he was admitting, after he would leave the hospital, he would go home and stay in shape and and call me and say, Lou, I'm staying in shape. If you can get me a fight, I'll take the fight. And he was able to get one of the first fights on ESPN in the comeback. But he's just a quality person. He's got a daughter, a wife. He works his ass off at, at, at Mount Sinai Hospital full time. And when he's not working his ass off at the hospital, he's working his ass off when the gyms are open or at home, trying to, trying to you know, perfect his craft. And I don't know that that kid's ever going to win, win a world title. I mean, he's got a terrific record now. He's like 20-1, and 21-1. and one. He's fought for a title already. He's getting a, a big opportunity on ESPN tomorrow night against Jose Pedraza. But I love those kind of stories. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, those of kind of careers and stories, like, it doesn't – those aren't the situations that make me money or get me, like, highly paid or – or, but but they're the kind of stories that keep me going because that you know what I mean. It, 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 uh, yeah, so like so Mikel so Lapierre is that kind of story, and, and 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 also a lot of the women I work with, they work hard, every bit as hard as all the men for a fraction of the money. A lot of them are single mothers. A lot of them have been victims of rape and, and physical assault. That's why they got into boxing. It's, yeah. you know, it's no accident that I'm so heavily invested in women's boxing. It's not the money. I'm not making money in women's yeah. boxing, but I, I, I love working with them and I, and I like being part of something that I see changing and growing. And I do think the women are earning their place. They're not being given any favorites. They're earning their place. You know, Katie Taylor, Clarissa Shields, Amanda Serrano, the women at the top, have worked really hard to get there. And, the, and there are an awful lot of women with championships who are really skilled athletes that are working really, really hard just to get a chance to make a living, not even to get wealthy, just to be able to get, make a living and do what they love to do. So I, I get a lot of fulfillment out of 
that part of my business too, the, the work I've been doing with the ladies. Thanks, sir. Lou, let me ask you, this is an awkward, this might be an awkward one. It's not, a, it's not a trick question or to trap you. Wilder against Fury, can Wilder win the rematch? Yes, he can, because he can knock anybody out if they don't see the punch coming. So, and by the way, he damn near knocked him out in the first fight. I thought he had him knocked out. So, yeah. could he? Yes. Uh, is he? Will he be a big underdog? He should be. A, he should be a real underdog. And 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 right now, I mean, you know, Fury has to be given the, the nod as the favorite. But but when you can punch like Deontay Wilder can punch, you can beat anybody. The other thing is, I think that Fury. I've always believed Fury was a more complete fighter than Deontay. That he's a better boxer. He's more skilled. He's more conventional. Doesn't have the same power necessarily. But you saw what happened in the last fight. When you're totally mastering somebody, that's power. That gives you power. Um, but Deontay had one of the worst nights of his career in the last fight. And yeah. and, and and I don't I don't nec I'm not necessarily pre I'm not predicting him necessarily to beat Fury. I definitely expect it will be better fight. I, I definitely expect a better fight the next time. What do you knowing, think, him better, knowing him, not, knowing him uh, better than we uh, do, Lou, do you think it will have affected him psychologically or will he go in there with the same confidence, same mindset, same attitude he did in the last two previous fights as everything? Um, I, I don't think he's a mentally weak man. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not like we hang out anymore. We're buddies, you know what I mean? But, uh, but, but I don't think he's a mentally weak person. I think he believes in himself and I think he's... Uh, I think he's got a support system in his family that's pretty strong, and I think he's going to go into the fight with confidence. That being said, when, you know, Deontay Wilder was the great destroyer, in the last fight he got destroyed. So even if you're dealing with that defeat as well as you possibly can, you, you're looking across the ring at someone that stopped you. So that has to have a little bit of a psychological impact. But I don't think he's a weak fighter or a weak man and I think that he will enter the fight believing he can win. And what do you think? I just... It's hard. Do you know, like, I know Lou, he knows him well, but I think that just how dominant Tyson was last time, I think Deontay's got to have some success early. If he doesn't have some success early, I can't make much of a case for him. But he has got that one-punch knockout power, and... Um, He's always dangerous to the end, but yeah, he starts after the, after the last fight. He starts a huge underdog. There's no denying that. I think yeah. what's probably not to him. Never is say, he can never say anybody who can punch as hard as him's got no chance. No, he's never rule them out. Never rule them out. Listen, I against think, Ortiz, think, he was losing every minute of every round, wasn't he? And then wow, one shot changed it all. I think the, the problem we have here in the UK is that uh, because of the things he said after the fight, made us it made us doubt his touch on reality. And we got, his, his costume was too heavy or X, Y, Z. He blamed Brill in the corner. So when he's talking... As, 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 well, in, in, fairness, he watched, in fairness, he watched Shelly Finkel walk in the ring and start screaming at Breland. Um, You know, I mean, Breland should have gotten a medal for stopping that fight because it should have been stopped a round or two earlier, if you want to know the truth. He, he was getting pummeled. He, 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 he had no chance to win that fight. And, and the only thing that was going to happen if that fight continued was a serious injury. You know, um, you know, look, it's hard. You, I, I think you're a fighter, Anthony, so you know better than us. But I think for anybody that's never tasted defeat, it's hard to taste it for the first time. And it, it's hard not to make excuses or give yourself reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, like, you know, th there was a lot of stuff that shouldn't have been said, et cetera. But I'm not going to, to jump on the bandwagon and attack him for that. Um, you know, I, 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 it's not an easy thing to – to lose that way when you view yourself as the king of the, of the division. Yeah. It's not, it's a very hard way to lose, particularly, you know, to be beaten down. And he was beaten down in that fight. Um, but I do expect a better fight the next time. And, and I, and honestly, I am interested to see what the next fight brings. I totally agree with Anthony. He cannot afford to start that fight slowly. He cannot afford to be backing. If he's backing up in the first couple of rounds to Tyson Fury, and he's retreating, he's in real, real trouble. Okay. John? John? Yeah, I, listen, I totally agree with him. I totally agree. It's about tactics and how he gets in there. 
and and right if you've been in there and you've you've you've, you've catched an ass beating but twice by somebody um, and 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 you've trained to the best of your ability unless there's things that have gone on that we don't know about then when you get in there to fight for a third time uh, then you're going to have pure it's the first time he's going to get in the ring and have real negative thoughts about the man in the opposite corner whereas before even all the way through his career that we've seen him he's been very positive very self-belief has been second to none uh, but again I'll harp on um, uh, the, the realisation of, 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 of of the whole the situation that the excuses that are used afterwards, and that to me let him down because up to that point we had a man in front of us that believed in every everything he said, everything he he, he executed in the ring, uh, but then afterwards that to me made me think, come on man, you you touch on reality is kind of slipping there. Do you not think, fellas, that there is that there's some parallels with maybe Ruiz against Joshua? Because I felt sorry for Mark after a while the fight that Mark seemed to really get blunt end at stake, and then Ruiz did say exactly the same with Reynosa. So should we be shocked, really, that you know both kids have lost, and first thing they do is blame? Trainer? But, but listen, like, we we can't we can't really comment on the Ruiz until let's see him in his next fight and his fight after that. You know, so so now for the first time we saw him. Well, Ruiz is the, the, well, wait, 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 wait. Ruiz is a lazy shit. Come on, let's just face reality. <laughs> no, no, I mean, he looks the way he looks for a reason. And, and he's a very, very, very talented athlete. And, I, and by the way, like, I don't dislike him as a person. I don't really know him. But, like, I, I mean, I think he's a fun guy just to follow. And if you listen to his interviews, he's entertaining. But he was in no kind of shape. He acted the fool from the second he beat AJ to the second they, they started the next fight. And, 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 frankly, he lost the second fight before the first bell rang. And, and, um, and, and he's not, you know, he, 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 his, his longtime trainer, who I think did a great job with him, who had been patient with him, he's gone. Um, Ruiz doesn't exactly look, from what I'm seeing on social media, as somebody that's turned over a new leaf with respect to his physique or his, or his training regimen. And, you know, I mean, like, I, it's not so much seeing his next fight. He has the body of work that he can stand behind. He was under, he, he was the wrong opponent for Anthony Joshua on short notice. That fight never should have been made. It was dumb as shit because there was no way in the world, even if Joshua looked, you know, won the fight, that he was going to look good fighting someone who looks physically as, as, you know, the way Ruiz does. He doesn't look like an Adonis. He looks like a doughboy. And, and he, but he can box like a mother. He, he's, he's a very skilled and very, very difficult style of heavyweight to fight. He, you know, and, and, and it's just, you know, Joshua had a bad night. Maybe he was damaged goods from training. I don't know. He didn't look like himself. Ruiz fought his best fight, and you saw the result. But I don't think that – I think the Ruiz you saw in the, the second Joshua fight – was the Ruiz you saw in most of his fights before the, the first Joshua fight. And the question's going to be, in his next fight, is he a completely different person? Well, from my experience, most fighters don't become completely different athletes or people. No, I agree. Me, me and Anthony said the other week, didn't we? Yeah. And I thought Reynoso was really bad, yeah. but he was really strong in the boss. Yeah, without a doubt, he has. He's, he's treating him like you say, the guy who got in there and stuff like that. There's just ways to go about business, isn't there? And listen, hopefully it works out for the guy. And like Lou said there, it's obvious he's not too dedicated to the sport, just looking at him. But if uh, the Canelo team can, you know, they can bring the best out of him, then it's going to be the right move. But we won't know, as Johnny said, so another fight, another two fights down the line. But you'd be surprised. Yeah, what, 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 what? What I'm about to say is never going to happen, right? But you know a heavyweight fight that I would prefer to see next as opposed to seeing Wilder against Fury 3? Um, forget about Fury and, 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 and Joshua because we know it's not happening next anyway. Um, but I, I would have liked to have seen Deontay coming off that loss against, against Andy Ruiz. And then yes. – yeah, and, I mean, and, then, and, then, and then the winner fighting Fury. Like, that would have been the kind of thing that I would have found, you know. I mean, I have no problem with the third fight between Wilder and Fury. But in a perfect world, would I want to see it next with nothing in between? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right. I would have rather seen. I would have rather seen AJ. It's not happening now because of the pandemic, the economy, everything else. But AJ fight Fury, Wilder fight uh, Ruiz. Uh, Ruiz, and then the winner of Wilder Ruiz fights the winner of the other fight. Yeah. Lou, but you know what? We don't do things. We don't do things that make sense very often in boxing. But, so. but, uh, you, Lou, Lou, you talk rationally. You shouldn't make that. Don't. Why are you doing that? Lou, listen to me. You're you're my new favorite promoter. I don't give a shit. You're my new favorite promoter. Uh, you got my back every day. I'm I'm a Lou I'm a Lou DeBello flag player. Thank, thank you, Johnny. I think you, my, <laughs> you know why I think I'm. You know why I think you don't give a shit, and I'm your new favorite promoter because I clearly, I so clearly don't give a shit. <laughs> so I mean, you know, I, I mean, I'm I'm at the stage of my career. I've been doing this for thirty years. The la- I'll be honest with you, like. It was an incredible, like, when I found out I got into the Hall of Fame on the first ballot, I was shocked. But it was, like, it was, like, such a great honor to me. But it really did, like, it, th- that was, like, the last, that was the last gold ring at the end of the, of the, the, you know, the fishing rod for me. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I'm not really the kind of guy that's, that's motivated by money so much. And when it comes to boxing, right, I want to see the sport get better. I'm still a fan. I want to see the best fights. I want to see competitive stuff. Uh, you know, before I watch a terrible show right now, I'll go on YouTube and watch Daddy Ward one again. You know, so I, I and, and the other thing too is like, if you like me, that's cool. If you don't like me, that's cool. But what you see is what you get. If we don't like you, we can go fuck ourselves, as you told me. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 Richard, that's well said, my friend. Well said. Like, Lou, just before you. Anyway, show- I, it, it was. It was good. Be, it was good. It was good being with you guys. I I enjoyed the last hour. Thank you for having me. And uh, maybe we'll do this some other time. Definitely. Thank you, Lou. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Lou. Take, Take care, care, Lou. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.